Hello, everyone. Welcome to the City Parks Alliance webinar about nature-based solutions to climate threats. I'm Diana Colangelo, and I'm a Senior Program Manager at City Parks Alliance. I'll be moderating today's discussion. For those of you that are new to City Parks Alliance, we are the only independent nationwide membership organization solely dedicated to urban parks. We're a network of cross-sector park leaders focused on the intersection between parks and other critical urban infrastructure to build equitable and healthy cities. You can visit our website at cityparksalliance.org to learn more. If you're interested in continuing education credits for AICP, LASIS, or City Parks Alliance's new general CEU certificate, watch for a follow-up email in the next two days with instructions on how to claim your credits. We'd like to spend a few minutes providing some information and trends about the climate threats we'll be talking about today, flooding, biodiversity loss, and heat which will provide some context for the nature-based solutions and projects our speakers will be sharing. But before we do that, I'd like to go over some quick housekeeping and introduce our guest speakers. We have a great turnout today and to ensure we can respond to everyone as questions or technical difficulties arise, here are some tips. To ask a question, click the questions icon on your screen. Type the question in the box and click send. Feel free to send questions throughout the presentations, just know we will be holding them until the end. If you experience a technical problem during the presentation, please type it in the question box and send it to us. And if you miss something, don't worry. Links to today's recording, the presentations, and related resources will be emailed to all registrants. Now to introduce our guest speakers. With us today are Anna Course, Principal and Denver Office Director at Sasaki, Shelley Arnold, President and CEO of Memorial Park Conservancy in Houston, Texas, Greg Jackson, Deputy Director of Tucson Parks and Recreation, and Blue Baldwin, Storm to Shade Program Manager at Tucson Water. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us today. So let's start with some information and trends about flooding. Floods are the most common and among the deadliest natural disasters in the US, and flooding occurs in every US state and territory. According to FEMA, as global warming continues to exacerbate sea level rise and extreme weather, our nation's floodplains are expected to grow by about 45% by century's end. According to one study, approximately 41 million U.S. residents are at risk from flooding along rivers and streams, while more than 8.6 million Americans live in areas susceptible to coastal flooding. And flood events are increasing. According to a climate science special report, U.S. coastal flooding has doubled in a matter of decades, and an EPA map indicates that in more than a dozen coastal cities, floods are now at least five times more common than they were in the 1950s. According to the Natural Resources Defense Council, while many factors, including climate change, contribute to flood events, human-driven elements can have a large impact. These include how we manage our waterways via dams, levees, and reservoirs, and the alterations we make to land that impact natural drainage systems. Anna will later be talking about a project in Baton Rouge that sought to restore the, the natural course of a bayou, thus addressing problems created by the former channelizing of this waterway and increasing flood resiliency. Now let's look at biodiversity loss. We are facing a biodiversity crisis. As many as 1 million plant and animal species face near-term extinction because of habitat loss. 40% of the world's plants are at risk of extinction, and according to a study by Yale University, the world's wildlife populations have declined by almost 70% in just the last 50 years. The study goes on to show that solving the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis are not separate issues because both plants and wild animals throughout their interaction with the environment help in the capture and storage of significant amounts of carbon. The study concludes that, quote, rewilding can be among the best nature-based climate solutions available to humankind. It turns out that biodiversity is also good for our health. The biodiversity hypothesis, which comes from the University of Helsinki, states that the more biodiverse the environment, the more resilient your immune system and its ability to protect the body from inflammatory disorders such as allergies and asthma. So with both ecological and human health in mind, it can be important to think about incorporating biodiverse and natural spaces in park projects and not just turf and fields that are used for recreation and events. Shelley will be talking about a project at Memorial Park in Houston that incorporated biodiversity goals and ecological design which has resulted in biodiversity wins and more resilient natural spaces for the community. And last, but certainly not least, heat. Heat is the number one weather-related killer in the United States. 
As average global temperatures continue to rise, the threats of both extreme heat events and chronic heat are projected to increase. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the 10 warmest years in the 143 year record have all occurred since 2010, with the last nine years, 2014 to 2022, ranking as the nine warmest years on record. We've all heard about the catastrophic consequences of the earth warming by just two degrees Celsius. But according to a climate science special report, if yearly emissions continue to increase rapidly as they have since 2000, models project that by the end of this century, global average temperature will be as much as 5.7 degrees Celsius or 10.2 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than the 1901 to 1960 average. We know that the burning of fossil fuels and the clearing of forests have accelerated the warming of the planet by releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Development and loss of green space exacerbate these problems, not only by eliminating natural spaces that can store carbon, but because of a phenomenon you're all likely familiar with, the urban heat island effect, whereby infrastructure such as buildings and roads absorb and re-emit the sun's heat more than natural landscapes such as forests and bodies of water. People in low-income communities of color are more likely to feel this effect acutely due to a lack of heat mitigating resources in their communities, such as tree canopy and green space. Greg and Blue will be talking about a program in Tucson that aims to incorporate more vegetation, native plants, and natural space within the urban context, helping to keep neighborhoods cooler while capturing stormwater. Now, I realize that I have just shared some dire statistics with you, the good news, and it's very good news, is that park leaders and landscape architects are perhaps more well positioned than nearly any other professionals to address these issues through green infrastructure projects and other nature-based solutions, improving not only ecological health and function, but the health and resilience of communities. You'll be hearing some great examples today that we hope you'll be able to adapt to your communities. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to our first speaker, Anna, who will talk about her work in Baton Rouge. Anna, take it away. Okay, thank you everyone. Oh, sorry. All right, thank you. I'm so excited to be here oh, today. Anna, I'm Anna. Anna, we're not actually see Oh, there we go. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> sorry. No worries. I'm Anna Course. I'm a principal landscape architecture uh, at Sasaki, and I'm going to be focusing in today on flooding. A little bit about Sasaki. Hideo Sasaki founded the firm in 1953, and as a landscape architect, he is really a pioneer in the interdisciplinary practice. He believes that landscape architects, architects, planners, urban designers, and engineers needed to come together to solve some of our biggest challenges that our world would be facing. That collaboration is in our DNA today. We're an over 350 person firm, um, split a third, a third, a third in each of those disciplines you'll see below. We have um, over 30 countries um, represented at our firm. We speak over 45 languages and I sit in the Denver office and run the Denver office as Diana uh, mentioned. Our passion is really creating public spaces, public spaces that respond to the community, public spaces that respond to the environmental challenges and threats that we're seeing today. Whether it's a brownfield that is then converted into Lakeland's destination and iconic park in central Florida, whether it's creating these small intimate moments in our parks that really allow people to get away from the hustle and bustle of their everyday lives, or whether it's converting Athens Airport into what will be Europe's largest urban park and coastal front. In every one of our designs, we truly believe that it needs is to be rooted in a restoration, needs to be rooted in ecology, and needs to understand the impacts that it will have on our cities and our environment. Sasaki is also deeply embedded in research. Um, we believe that research informs our practice and that it's this balancing of giving and taking as we go through both academic research as well as practical research. 
I led the research called Climate Park Change with NRPA as a partner. We really focused in on our parks and trying to understand how parks could help adapt and mitigate the biggest impacts from climate change. We studied a ton of different impacts from climate change, from poor air quality to landslides to wildfires. And what I'm going to focus in today is inland flooding. You know, you heard a lot of statistics from Diana around coastal flooding, but a lot of these areas that are flooding are really not involved on the coast. They're really seeing these impacts of climate change inland. The case study that I'll focus in today is Greenwood Park in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Sasaki was hired in 2018 to lead this master planning effort. It was really an interdisciplinary plan um, with landscape architecture, architecture, civil engineering, planning, and urban design. Prior to joining um, this project and kicking it off, there was a huge event in 2016. It was a one in a thousand year storm event. And this did not have to do with hurricanes. It was a three, year, a three day downpour event that happened in Baton Rouge. During those three days, 7.1 trillion gallons of storm water hit East Baton Rouge. It's enough to fill four Lake Poncha trains. This is almost two times the amount of water that happened during Hurricane Katrina. And 28,000 households were impacted, 17,000 of them being very low income. I think a lot of times um, the, the hurricanes and sort of those big events are really what get in the news or hit the news. This really went um, uh, really under undercovered. No one really knew about this as it moved into um, this disaster. We also wanted to look at Greenwood Park and the relationship that Greenwood Park had to the flooding of this event. And so when you look at Greenwood Park in the image on the right, you see that red little square. Greenwood Park sits in the predominantly African American community. It's in North Baton Rouge. This area, when you start looking in, how the flooding impacted it in 2016 um, had some of the biggest impacts. Um, the flooding really went through Greenwood Park and it hit a lot of those communities outside Greenwood Park, which happened to be lower income. Greenwood Park also saw a lot of challenges um, historically with racial segregation. There was a, a northern golf course that was for white golfers and a southern golf course that was for black golfers. So we're starting to tie in the, the histories of Greenwood Park, these flooding events that we saw in 2016. And then really the last thing that happened before we started was a proposal to move um, Greenwood Park's uh, zoo, that was the Brex Baton Rouge Zoo, out of Greenwood Park. The community at that point came and said, look, there's been a lot of disinvestment in Greenwood Park. We wanna keep the zoo here. And that really triggered this master plan study. So when Sasaki came in, um, I, I have to admit this was kind of a contentious uh, moment in, in the history of this project. And there was a lot of distrust happening from the community. And so we wanted to start by creating a big vision that this Greenwood Park would be a neighborhood park for North Baton Rouge, as well as a regional destination for the East Baton Rouge Parish and beyond. And so we actually started by flipping the script. We flipped actually physically what was north and south, and we wanted to say, let's look at Greenwood Park as the center, and let's think about all the opportunities that Greenwood Park has to solve some of these challenges, from environmental challenges to social challenges. And we started by understanding the community that we were serving, all the different contributing voices. In over 10 months, we wanted to build the trust of the community before we started getting into the details of this design. We needed to listen to them first. And so for four months, we listened. We uncovered a lot of those issues, those challenges. Then we started to build trust by designing, thinking of these different options, bringing ideas to the community. And then ultimately, we wanted to instill that ownership. And so over 10 months, we talked to 4,000 people as we did a deeper dive into the design of this site. Over those 10 months, we really created these guiding principles. And these are ideas that throughout the design process, we constantly came back to. And so we wanted to ensure that we we're celebrating Louisiana's nature. We were creating a park for the everyday and the big day. They were really opening up and reaching out to these communities surrounding Greenwood Park. And we were really welcoming and growing within the park itself. The park is 660 acres and it is the largest park within the Brex system. And so there was so much opportunity to really take all these guiding principles, embed them in the design, and then work with that community to implement them. So after we uh, listened and, and did kind of that qualitative analysis, we wanted to get into that quantitative analysis. And so we started looking at mapping and understanding all these systems. 
knowing that that 2016 flood was in the back of our mind, we wanted to understand how can we ensure that Greenwood Park helps with some of these bigger issues. So we looked at the built environment, kind of the surface, which included the floodplain, the soils, the elevations, and then the ecology on site. And what we did is we created a map that you'll see on the right that we really called our opportunities map. In the green, you'll see this um, swath that kind of makes this Y that comes through the park itself. We saw this area as having a lot of ecological benefit. Um, the Cypress Bayou ran through that. So we wanted to really preserve that and start enhancing that. Then the areas that are gray and white, those were areas that we saw that had a lot of ability for change and that we could start bringing programming and start curating and morphing the design within those areas. So we did another layer of analysis within that green swath and looking at the Cypress Bayou. And what we started to see is that Cypress Bayou had a lot of potential. So it went all the way north and south through Greenwood Park and really connected through that lake system. We saw this as an opportunity to impact watersheds and not inversely impact downstream areas. So what if we could capture some of that water that happened in 2016 and really make Greenwood Park this working landscape that really focused on Cypress Bayou? Um, as I mentioned, this was an interdisciplinary project, and so I was working with my partner, uh, who's a civil engineer. And so I'm going to get a little nerdy here for a minute um, and really talk about some of the engineering with this. So we wanted to understand why did Cypress Bayou flood? Why, why did that park not actually help with some of that stormwater? What was going on? And so what we found is there's a lot of old school engineering solutions that were happening at Greenwood Park, that it was channelized, the bayou had really steep edges, that there was dams, series of culverts, and so it really wasn't functioning the way it should have been historically. So then we wanted to understand how did it function historically? And so the first thing to know about a bayou is that it's not a river. It's meant to be flat, marshy, soggy, and very slow moving. A bayou is meant to flood. And so when you look at the map on the right, you see 1987 and there's a little blue line that is, is fairly straight. That is the bayou channel today. Then in 1954, if you go back, we were able to map out the historic bayou. And it's just going all over the place. It's got these incredible, beautiful meanders that are kind of moving through the park. That's how the bayou wants to flood. It wanted to go back to its historic bends. We then started looking at the existing bayou today. So this is the lake at the north side and kind of going down um, all the way to the south of the park. And we started looking at the flooding of different events. And what you'll see is the bayou today starts to charge out into these oxbows. Those oxbows were part of that historic bayou. So we could see that even this channelized bayou wanted to flood in the way that it did historically years ago. So let's use this as an opportunity to solve the problem and think about how this bayou could be reconfigured to help with some of these issues. So the design goals. We wanted to decrease that total slope to bring that back to that very soft, soggy, flat, marshy bottom. We want to increase the total length of the bayou by adding in those meanders, by letting it go back to the way it was, we would be able to um, really increase that. And then we wanted to decrease that mitig and mitigate the hydraulic jumps in the system. So the design results um, really was a regrading effort to bring back those slopes. We wanted to activate the bayou from the site runoff. So having all the runoff from floods, from big rain events could come into the bayou and it then would flood the way that it historically did. We also wanted to increase this length by 160%. So this is significant and this is where we're going to allow some of that flood mitigation to happen within the bayou itself. So bringing that back to kind of a master plan strategy and thinking through how we would start to implement this, we wanted to one, extend the bayou, to reconnect the bayou, so that's going back to those historic meanders, and then expand that bayou so that when flooding events happen, it can fill in those areas and really start to do what it historically did. And this is really bringing us up to a 100-year storm event, which is something that um, the Cypress Bayou was not able to ha handle that capacity until it was redesigned. So what this looks like today, so there's the existing bayou channel, as you can see, very channelized. And then you can see on the sides, those were some of the areas that wanted to flood. So if we can think about bringing those out, connecting those systems again, we can start to create this very dynamic bayou. 
the next thing we wanted to look at is how do we start programming this? Can we can we actually start bringing some of those community ideas, some of those um, events into the Bayou itself? And then how do we balance that with some of the natural systems that we really need to integrate to hit some of those guiding principles and those overall arching achieving goals that we identified early on in the master planning process? We also wanted to look at restoring ecologies. So the bayou and the restoration there is just one aspect of this. When we started to look at the overall Greenwood Park, we noticed there's a lot of invasive species that were happening. A lot of these invasive species were coming up along the bayou because it wasn't flooding. Some of these areas in South Louisiana need to flood to help take care of some of those invasive species. So we said this is this is maybe an opportunity to think about landscape processes as part of a design driver. So within this, we started thinking about each of those conditions. So if we have an existing forest with invasive species, we're then able to recharge that bayou and start to reform it. That allows us to flood some of those areas to control the invasive species through that landscape process. Once that is um, taken care of, we can come back, propagate, and install these new native species. And then ultimately, it's about this long-term forest restoration. So starting early on in thinking about that historic bayou and what it did actually would help us long-term with that restoration. Now that we got the alignment figured out, the ecological restoration sort of planned within, the, within this master planning effort, we wanted to fill in the gaps and think about that recreation and going back to the community and the engagement and what we heard from those over 4,000 people and different touch points. People were really excited about having blue trails um, within the Cypress Bayou. People were really excited about having canopy walks and really experience the nature. Um, what if we actually activated uh, the waterfront with a music venue. Uh, if anyone's been to Louisiana, you know that music is a huge part of the culture there. And then finally, what if you actually allowed people to get into the Cypress Bayou and have this really beautiful bayou walk? So we started to tease out some of those elements um, from our engagement and started to embed them within the master planning process itself and looking at how we could balance these big major events. So what if we bought a waterfront amphitheater out onto this new restored bayou, looking at the lake and how it could spill out there? What if we looked at this riparian forest as an incredible experience and creating these different wetland pathways that connect you through each of these areas? Um, we also wanted to embed areas that would allow people to come together and gather, so big picnic areas. So if you had a, a, a crawfish boil, you could bring your family out here and do that, as well as having those more quiet, intimate moments that really helped you get into the park and experience nature in a way that you really hadn't been able to in Greenwood Park. So those really manifested themselves in, again, the guiding principles, this idea of the big day. So where are you coming for that big music event, the big crawfish boils, the big birthday parties, and still having that water system as a driver of design, that connection back to the water that really hadn't been there um, previously. We also want to think about education throughout this entire project. So in working together with the designer for the Baton Rouge Zoo, we designed the entrance plaza into the zoo and thought that as people get out of a school bus or get out of their car and walking into the zoo, they're going to see some of those restoration um, uh, strategies and having de demonstrations right there at the forefront so that you know sustainability is a huge driver in the design. And then how do you start integrating those quieter moments for people to understand and be educated on the power and importance of the bayou here in South, South Louisiana, and specifically what the Cypress Bayou is doing in Greenwood Park? So creating these more subtle boardwalks that are taking you through the Cypress Bayou, and then up on top having the bayou promenade that's really connecting you back and forth through the park. We took this idea of restoration and what the bayou meant um, all, the, all the way through design and thinking about how that could be inspiration for areas like a playground. And so one of the first phases will be this adventure playground and we actually pulled um, those forms and those, uh, those ideas of restoration into the playground itself. So even if you're not on the bayou, when you're in the playground, you're starting to understand some of these components and what's so special about having this type of landscape in Greenwood Park. So after 10 months, 
um, we were happy to report that everyone was excited and supportive. And so these are actually um, quotes from newspapers and how we really went from 2018 to 2019, where people were saying, this is, this is like a dream. And everyone was unbelievably excited. And then Sasaki was fortunate enough to move forward with phase one. So there was a groundbreaking um, and we were really excited to report back that the phase one included the Cypress Bayou, the restoration, as well as some other major ecological moves within Greenwood Park. One thing we did within the master plan process that really set us up for that phase one was thinking about the park impacts and implementation in a way that provides local good, not displacement. And so in that master plan, we actually put out goals and that we're able to follow through with those goals into the phase one. So 30% uh, DB, SB, and MB contractor participation in phase one, um, a public contribution of 47 million into that phase one construction, and then really looking at some of those metrics like a 25% reduction in downstream um, flood output. So all of those that were really identified early on in that master planning phase really helped set up how we move into construction and implementation. That initial um, funding actually unlocked an additional grant. So Breck was able to receive 4.7 million for the Cypress Bayou flooding mitigation project. And so it was, it was taking some of those initial ideas and how restoration could be a driver of design that allowed um, Breck and the rest of the team to really unlock that flooding to help move this project into reality. As we've gotten into construction, we're really thinking about every opportunity in the restoration of the Cypress Bayou. So if there are any logs that have been down, they're actually being used to create new wetland benches. We actually want to keep those logs in place because that is how a natural bayou would work and allow them to decompose and actually give back to the soil itself. Here you can start to see the alignment starting to take place. Um, after some of the clearing had happened and the flooding was allowed, we were able to come back and really plant this with a lot of the native vegetation and species. And really getting into the details and the design of that and how we can really move this forward into becoming one of Southern Louisiana's um, iconic restoration projects. Um, this has taken a lot of work. Um, we're still right in the middle of construction, and so we're really excited to see the progress of this as we're moving forward into that phase one opening day. So a couple lessons learned that I want to end with. Um, understand the history of the site, and I say that because you need to understand all histories. And so while this uh, particular case study was focused on kind of the environmental and the hydrological histories, it was so important to understand the social histories and everything that had happened in Greenwood Park that really set us up to where we began at the master plan and really helped us get to the very end in a very positive and impactful way. Build trust through listening first. As I mentioned, there was there was a lot of distrust um, when we started this, this process, and we really wanted to listen, and we spent months and months listening first, understanding concerns um, from all people throughout the process. Explore the technical challenges early in the process. So a lot of those designs, those ideas, um, happened in a master plan because we wanted to ensure at the end of that master planning process, we had something that could be implemented, something that could really move forward and show a first phase and show the community how this could happen and really restore that Cypress Bayou. Iterate, iterate, iterate. Um, I'm showing just a few snapshots of the design process. We have hundreds and hundreds of slides of hundreds and hundreds of back and forth dialogues and understanding, you know, how does engineering and how does landscape architecture work together? How can we embed architecture within this? And so we just constantly kept iterating with the client, with Breck to understand how we could ensure that this was meeting all of their goals, the community goals and the environmental goals. And finally, be bold. We believed in some very, very um, beautiful, strong principles up front, and we continued those principles all the way through, all the way through uh, construction. And if we hadn't been bold at the very beginning in stating some of those, I think they would have started to get distilled as we got into the more details of the construction process. So say it, work it, rework it, and then make sure that that is really memorialized in your documents and help you move forward into the final construction that. Thank you so much for your time and I'm excited to hear from the rest of the team. Great. Thanks, Anna.
Um, what I love about this project is the really strong, you know, community engagement point that you've talked about, but also um, kind of fixing some of that, as you said, sort of old school engineering um, and really um, just restoring those lovely meanderings, which then in turn has allowed the community to be kind of protected from the worst impacts of that flooding. So very inspirational. So now we're going to turn it over to Shelly at Memorial Park Conservancy. Take it away, Shelly. Thank you. And, and you'll hear some similar themes, actually, in, in our work. Um, and it was it's really it was really exciting hearing about your project. I'm Shelley Arnold. I'm with Memorial Park Conservancy. We are a private nonprofit organization. We manage 1,100 of Memorial Park's 1,500 acres. And I'm here. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And I'm here representing a large group of folks from my own team, my own organization, to our project partners, to uh, park users and visit visitors and donors. We have a really broad coalition that's been working on Memorial Park. For, for a few years together now. Uh, today, I wanna to give you some context about um, how we got to where we are today in terms of the land history of Memorial Park and people and land together, and then the research and design process that we went through the master planning process, and then finally what we've delivered and what, it's, what, what it is about, what it means. Um, so the, let me just switch slides here. Uh, Memorial Park is um, significant locally and it's significant nationally. It is one of the nation's largest centrally located urban parks and it's also the largest centrally located urban park in Houston. It's essentially a wilderness park and an active recreation park. It's, it's we consider it the largest free public health asset in Houston. Um, and it's, you know, this is Memorial Park in the background with Central Park overlaid just to show you the size and the scale. Most people know Central Park, so we we take it as a as a kind of a reference point, being almost two times the size of Central Park. And you know, our area, the Gulf Coast, um, traditionally was largely um, Gulf Coast native prairie. And the first peoples in this area, in our area specifically, the park the park area, were the Karankawa. And the Karankawa lived in concert with the land. And they mimicked nature and and had controlled burns um, of the prairie. That's how they controlled and managed the land. It was really in concert with nature. And we know this because we did research that showed um, cores of ash down below what was prairie land during our work. We looked also at the next peoples that occupied and, and used the land and how the use of the land changed over time. And so the, the next people were the cowboys and, and then the ranchers, and they came because of the prairie. They came to manage the prairie. They used it in a different way. Uh, we also had nurseries that came in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and they, bought, they brought with them what we think of as invasive plants today. Um, we had a pine logging operation on the site that once was a native Gulf Coast prairie. That pine logging operation really converted the land that was one of the big i mean all of these things impacted the land but that was a big impact to the land that led to to uh to the growth of a pine and and mixed hardwood forest really and so uh this this area this space this 1500 acres was once a military training camp it opened during world war one to convert u.s um well national guard to become u.s army and at that time they found this pine wood forest with some mix of Anna and Prairie, they, they pretty much clear cut, almost clear cut the pine forest. Um, and that led to, uh, when they closed, that led to the growth of pine trees, kind of the almost what people thought of as the East Texas piney woods as a predominant, almost the predominant um, landscape in Memorial Park in the 1500 acres of Memorial Park. And so people, um, for generations now, we're almost 100 years old as a park, have known this park as this pine, you know, pine park, this mixed hardwood park, also filled with invasives. We have a bio on the side, so I can, you know, on the edge, the southern border, I can certainly uh, identify with everything that, that Anna just said. Um, Memorial Park is very special in people's hearts. People have been coming, um, they come for generations, they come, literally, people come, make this a part of their lives, some people come three or four times a week, five, six days a week. They spend uh, as much time here as they may spend at their work or their home or their church. It has a very, very spe special place in people's lives. In 2011, 2010, 2011, 
um, the Texas region and, and I think other areas of the U.S. suffered a, a, a drought, a really uh, intense and prolonged drought. And these were the headlines. What the city experienced was a loss in some areas of the park, this city park that's centrally located, that's used by people from 170 zip codes across the city. They experienced um, in some areas, 90% tree loss. Um, these were the kind of headlines we faced. And for this beloved space, this is what Houstonians experienced. And uh, this was very visible. There's a six lane roadway that cuts the park in half. 55,000 drivers a day. So this was experienced by these drivers. This was experienced by everybody that comes to the park, which are millions of people a year. And it was heartbreaking. It was really heartbreaking. The catalyst, well, I should say the silver lining was that this was a catalyst for change. Um, the park, because you know it was an urban park paid for through general funds. Uh, we were not really as much a part of it as we are now. We were three people, $300,000 at this time. Um, the, there was a catalyst for a commitment from both the public sector and the private sector to care for Memorial Park. Um, there were only about there was only about four hundred thousand dollars being spent on eleven $1 hundred acres uh, by the city, and then the conservancy kicked something in too. It wasn't enough to to care for this space, and thus we got what we got with nothing else uh, coming up behind it. Um, and so that was the catalyst. And in a few short years, we've gone to what I'm going to describe today. I'm going to talk about two projects that we open that represent important green infrastructure. There are about 100 acres each. We've opened four projects since 2020 with this public-private sector partnership. And these are the headlines that we have now. Um, just three, four months ago, we opened a land, uh, the Kinder Land Bridge in Civia and Melvin Wolf Prairie that covers a large part of the six-lane virtual highway um, that cuts the park in half. You can see, this is a rendering, but I'll show you some actual pictures. And so I wanted to talk to you about how we achieved what we've achieved. And, and, and a lot of it mirrors what, what Anna was describing. And we started with um, a very bold vision. And so we, we came together as, a, as a, a public and private sector partnership with you know, the city, the parks department, the mayor's office, Uptown, Uptown Houston, which is a local taxing entity, and the conservancy. We started together and it wasn't that we were gonna restore the park as it was. That's what people thought they wanted, but we were going to elevate the park and elevate people's lives using the park and elevate Houston on a national scale. These were uh, you know, kind of some of the high level vision um, considerations that we started with. And we were all aligned that we were going to do something very big. And so the first kind of partner that we brought in besides the one we formed was our landscape architect. And so we looked we looked at what we thought were the best of the best of landscape architects in the world for the kind of project that we had, which was an ecological restoration project, uh, a green infrastructure project, something to um, really make the park special and improve the uh, amenities dramatically, something to improve the basics. These were some of the things that we looked at. Um, we also built community. We tapped the community. We listened to the community. We, there was a lot of mistrust of this partnership of our organization as we started. So um, unfortunately, there was just mistrust, a little while like what you're describing, but more from, I'd say, ecological community and citizens. What are you going to do to my park? What are you going to do to my park? And so I'll talk about how we overcame that. Um, I want to also talk about how we were, we're, our work's grounded in research and in data and science and public input. And we, we did it from a systems approach. And so our, our first partners that we started with were here on this in this left box, uh, the four kind of at the bottom here. We brought in Nelson Bird Waltz because they had done ecological restoration, um, significant amounts of large scale ecological restoration. They had done a lot of work in urban parks and renewing and restoring and elevating urban parks. And most importantly, they took an approach that was data driven and science driven and based in asking questions and studying, looking at demographics, looking at the future, asking. And so that's how we started. And, and they and we brought in a whole suite of, uh, of partner organizations to work with us and inform us uh, from the very beginning before we started, uh, before we actually started design for a master plan. And so we did start with these, this public input process, this engagement process. We had uh, 3,300 engagement points or 
participating. We spent $100,000 on this. We brought in Lord Cultural Resources from out of town to help us with this process. Um, we had eight public meetings. We had them in English. We had them in Spanish. We had them all over the city, workshops, online surveys to understand what Houstonians wanted first. That's what we wanted to understand first or what they valued. We also, by the way, looked at demographics. We brought in a demographer. Um, we included, uh, we really sought to include. So I mentioned the mistrust that we faced when we started. Um, I, I had direct sort of, uh, uh, a really direct um, opposition from the Sierra Club and it's quite extensive in Houston. Um, and and I asked them, it was my third week on the job. And I said, you know, what what, what is it that you want? I too want what you want. What is it that you want? And they helped me create a panel of, we called it the Ecotech panel of 25 specialists in their field, ranging from um, from birds to you know to bugs to to water to soils, and and that was in, that was really important. It informed what we did in a very genuine and deep way for the rest of our work, and they stayed with us through the master planning process, and many still work with us today. And then we ground truth. We got on, we got out in the park, every inch of the park. Our landscape architect with us, um, our partners with us. Um, we covered every inch of the park. We were in the mud. We were on mountain bikes. The, the the landscape architecture firm didn't sit in their offices in Charlottesville and New York. They were here with us. They didn't seek to impose sort of their ego and their design. They were here with us studying and learning and listening, um, like what, what Anna described. Um, and then we baselined and we, we sought to understand what lives in the park, what is present in the park. We know that there are a number of species that are no longer present in the park, but what's present today at the time we started and how can we positively affect that with our plantings, with what we did in the park. And so uh, we had an important actually insight right out of the gate when we did this bioassessment survey back in 2016. And that was this species of animal. Uh, eco ecology folks didn't think it really existed much in Buffalo Bayou anymore. Um, it's an endangered species. And we, we found four in our research and that triggered another extensive national study that's ongoing now and so far they've identified um, well over 100 radioing tagging and there uh, and we don't broadcast as broadly although to you we will because you're this audience uh, but they are um, identifying they've identified that this may be the most prolific breeding ground in the world although this is limited to the southeastern United States and it may be evolving into another species and that's an important um, insight that that was catalyzed by the work that we started. Um, we also learned what the native ecologies were to this space. They they were there was some pine forest, there was riparian certainly forest, but it wasn't predominant like what we have been seeing. And everyone thought we had this virgin East Texas piney woods, and that's not what was predominant on the site hundreds, thousands of years ago until recently. It was coastal prairie, native Gulf coastal prairie, post oak savanna. It was wetlands, it was bayou. And so that explains a lot of what we're experiencing in the park and around the city today, this conversion away from these native habitats and these native ecologies. And so we spent a year and a half asking, listening, studying before we began design. And then in 2015, we took a master plan to city council that passed unanimously and was held up as actually the best planning and design work they had ever seen. Um, we, we sought with this design, we seek to reconnect many things, um, the waterways, the trails, the people, the systems, and even memories, hearkening back to our history to learn from and to grow from, um, to consolidate compatible uses together. So we had a drop and plop situation where ball fields and or they were just everywhere, roadways were everywhere. Um, we sought to restore the ecology of the park. I've mentioned that. Um, and our real connection to it, and to, to really enhance and elevate user experience um, and tend, tend, tend the culture, tend the land. And we want people to become curators themselves, um, stewards of this space and this park. Um, and we seek to do that through responsible management. And we, we did, by the way, take over park management only in 2016 of these 1,100 acres. Um, that was part of the, the master plan work that we did leading into the 10 year plan that we've put in place. The Kinder Foundation joined us, uh, which has done uh, really groundbreaking and pioneering work in green space and parks throughout Houston. You, you should research them. It, it, they're very, very interesting. The public-private partnership model 
that they are helping uh, proliferate. Um, and we, we focused on the projects that would catalyze change for Houston. Um, they provided the largest catalyst gift, I've used that word a lot, um, in, um, well, the, the largest gift in Houston Park System's history for this, to catalyze commitment to the park, to leverage uh, public and private sector dollars. Um, but we defined a suite of 10 years of projects to deliver together that I'll talk about two. I'll talk about two of those projects, but the goal was to accelerate the delivery of the projects that would be most impactful and most transformative for Houston. We started design, we started with the soils, we used 40,000 trees from the drought, the drought, I should say, to create compost. We left as many in place as we could, but if they were hazards, we moved them, we composted them, and they provided um, a much greater ecological service than they did um, as, a, as a standing dying tree in the park because the soils were so nutrient deficient um, and structurally unsound. We looked at the conditions on the ground. This was just, this is to illustrate not to go into detail, but to illustrate the types of ecologies that around 2014 we, we had, and this illustrates where we were going. Um, and this is the, we, we laid out the types of ecologies that we needed to have that were more sustainable given uh, the topography, you know, given the hydrology, and then we used native plantings um, and restoration of soils to achieve these things and achieve other goals, including biodiversity, for example. Um, we looked at things as systems, integrated systems, and how can we address multiple needs um, comprehensively? So how can we think of the park as part of a greater system across Houston, across the Gulf Coast? How can we address things comprehensively, not as isolated projects? And so one of the things we looked at was the park as part of this former prairie system, as I mentioned, and we sought to reinstill this prairie, um, rebuild this prairie. So it's not that we were going to rebuild the park as it was recently. It was that we were going to reconstruct nature as it was sustainable for so many thousands of years. Um, and so uh, we, we leverage prairie, wetlands, um, savanna, some forest, riparian forest, and some pine forest. But in this case, we also had to do a lot of educating, and we still are, um, that prairie is the most resilient, it sequesters the most stormwater, the most CO2 compared to other ecologies for us helps with sediment reduction, cleanses the bio, cleanses the water, and fosters greatest, the greatest biodiversity. We had Harvey happen during this process, and that prompted us to look even more deeply at inundation studies and capacity. And so we looked at the future land bridge project and prairie project that I'll discuss and other areas from an inundation perspective. And then we, look, we looked at systems. We looked at animal systems people, water, uh, soil systems, how to reconnect them, how to stitch them back together. We, we even considered drivers, 55,000 people come up and drive up and down Memorial Park, 55,000 cars every day. And that they were important to consider as we planned future Memorial Park. Um, and then we built our team. So we were, when I started in 2003, 13, and I started to do this, we were three people and we had a budget of $300,000. And we have become a team of 60 with deep expertise in a number of areas, and we're operating on a much larger budget that is both operating and capital in nature. Now I want to switch gears quickly and talk to the uh, talk to two specific projects to give you an example of how we did environmentally intentional design. Um, this is Eastern Glades Clay Family Eastern Glades. This opened in 2020. I hope you can see my cursor. I'm circling the area. It is approximately 100 acres. We didn't touch all 100, 100 acres, a significant portion of the 100 acres. You can see the forest here. This is part of the forest. We actually did go in and work and restore. What's in, Many things are important about this, but one thing is that this was a degrading forest. The entire 100 acres was a degrading forest filled with invasives, wasn't accessible to people, and it really didn't help that much um, with stormwater management or some of the other goals that I laid out. And it was divided in half by a road and a trail a very popular road and trail that ran through here. And so the first thing we did was look at, you know, one of the things, how to stitch Memorial Park back together. We moved the road and the trail, actually our project partner at Uptown, moved the road and the trail, and they helped with some of the infrastructure. They led a lot of this. They built the first part of this lake that we use as a three-tiered stormwater management system. 
to capture the water that normally would shoot down to Buffalo Bayou in a heavy rain through, you know, just straight across the land, or we could have put in a pipe and culvert system, but we didn't. We kept the water here and we cleanse it. We use it for um, irrigation and we created habitat. We planted um, wetlands along the edge and we have a really thriving habitat in this whole zone. We also created an immersive and beautiful nature experience and gathering experience that harkens back and tells the stories of some of our histories. We heard we didn't have enough gathering spaces for Houstonians in this park, and we didn't. And so this was one of the first projects that we did. Here's an example of the beauty that we designed. I talk about elevating Houstonians. Um, this, again, this lake wasn't here, this wasn't here. The forest was here. When we, this part of the forest actually edge, we have restored, we are working on this. We built this lake with some of the design intention I mentioned, and all the architectural features are very, um, most of them harken back to history. This is intended to inspire, um, uh, it was informed by the, the Camp Logan World War I tents that we found as part of the World War I training camp. Uh, we, we have had, by observation, not by study, a major biodiversity win right at first. And again, we're going to go in and do a scientific study to document this and other wins that we think that we've had. But observationally, um, as described by the Houston Audubon Society, these birds called least screeves didn't live in Memorial Park. They didn't, they really don't come to Houston very often. They're occasionally spotted in Houston coming up from South, coming up from the South, from South mm -hmm. Texas. And the, a, ne a nesting pair, as soon as we opened the lake and built the habitat, as soon as it got a little bit established, they moved in, had babies, they keep having babies, they keep coming back and we, we hear them and see them all the time. We'll be doing a study, I hope, in this more established area this year. And then right when we opened this project, planted with native plants, we had this. This was um, Storm, it was a URI, and it was in February of 2021. We opened in July of 2020. We planted with native plants. We planted for resiliency. We planted for biodiversity. We planted for stormwater management, carbon sequestration, and I will say, the native plants played a big role in quick recovery from this. We had a lot more problems with the pipes and the plumbing that we did with plants. And then the next project that we opened, the next one that I would consider this of this scale and a, a, a piece of green infrastructure is this um, Kinder, Kinder Land Bridge in Sivia and Melvin Wolf Prairie. And this was just open so you can see the bare ground. It's growing in, it's just been planted. But I want to explain what you're looking at. So this, this, this was Memorial Drive. It was over here. We moved it so that we could actually build um, this without, without closing this very busy roadway. And then we, we dug these out. So th to give you scale, this is a car or a truck or something. This is a car. We dug this prairie out. We dug it as a prairie. We dug this out. It was ball fields and parking lots. We moved them to another part of the park, um, more fitting for a ball field and a parking lot and to reclaim this wilderness. We joined this space together by putting the dirt, the 500,000 cubic yards of dirt on top of um, these tunnels that we created. We created beautiful driving experience for users. And so this captures water. It reconnected a, a water system. This reconnected severed wildlife corridors. And so animals could go under through the culvert that was designed as a critter crossing with light wells and shelving or they can go over. This was, this was initiated originally to help people cross and get to this side and to help animals cross back and forth. Um, and then we researched and thought of it as a system and then learned and did so much more. This is a forested area. Houston doesn't have hills. This is a really exciting uh, vantage point for people and it's breezy, it's nice, it's 35 feet, these two, 35 feet high and people love this space, even though it's brand new and looks kind of like this. It's looking a little more like this right now. You can see the water system working. This is, what, you know, we captured one of the five drainage fingers that flows through the park, channeled it. Um, this prairie will serve as detention. Um, and so uh, that's the study that you saw when I said the Harvey detention study. This is the result of that. Um, and then you see people in nature. So we sought to create a beautiful immersive experience that would help increase people's understanding and value of this kind of space. They had seen this before, now they experienced this. We put them right in the middle of it um, while allowing it to grow. So this is actually a paved trail um, and, they, and they really love it. 
And we want people to steward these spaces with us going forward. And then finally, another interesting feature is this, it's called the Clay Family um, Scramble, Emily Clay Family Scramble. This, these were pieces of Memorial Drive. When we moved the road, we harvested these pieces of the road and we created this really exciting feature for people to enjoy. And it's really beautiful up close. The roadway, the pieces look like terrazzo tile and you can see reflectors and you can see road lines. But this is very poetic. I mean, it certainly it speaks to our value of recycling and upcycling. But this is a this this is a place where the park now wins. The green wins over gray. The road is in service to the park instead of the park being in service to the road as, as it has been for generations. And just wrapping up. Um, I really wrote this more for you all to read later to the, for those of you who are interested. But, you know, this echoes, uh, you know, what Anna was saying about being bold, be appropriately bold, but be bold and be differentiated or you won't attract. You, you need to work together. You've got to attract the, the top talent to whatever you're doing, whether it's a partner, whether it's a vendor, whether it's a consultant, um, whether it's your own team. But unless you have a really interesting and compelling and meaningful vision, work in systems, secure early wins, and build momentum and build trust. I think we've done a good job of that. Uh, people who even opposed what we were going to do or were fearful, many people tell me now that they're thrilled. And so I will leave it at that. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, present today. Great, thanks so much, Shelley. Yeah, I really love the kind of the mindset shift to ecological time that had to happen. And I think it's so impressive that you and your whole team really chose to dig deep on what belonged there and what would thrive there. And now you have this really gorgeous and, and healthy space. And it seems like you've really brought the community along with you on that as well. So very inspiring. Um, let's turn it over to uh, Blue and Greg. It's the city of Tucson. Take it away. Thank you. Let's see if we can get situated here. I'm Greg Jackson, Deputy Director with Tucson Parks and Recreation Department, and we also have Blue Baldwin, the Storm to Shade Program Manager with the Tucson Water Department. And so you just heard some really good information from Anna and Stacy about, you know, or Anna and Shelley about flood, diversity from Houston, Baton Rouge. Well, we're going to talk about Tucson, Arizona, and Tucson is all about the heat. Um, we live in the Sonoran Desert. It's a hot pretty much year round. We have four months where our average temperature is in the upper 90s. Uh, we only get about 11 inches of rain a year. And we've been in a drought for the last 15, 20 years. So a lot of years we're not even getting 11 inches of rain. Tucson's the third fastest warming city in the US. We are behind Phoenix and Las Vegas. So clearly a lot of heat urban island, urban effect in our cities. And the reality is shade really is a hot commodity. So you're gonna hear a lot about how we're trying to use water, how to create shade to better the community. Just a little bit about parks and recreation. We have 132 parks that we manage here in Tucson, a little over 3,300 acres. One of the things we have focused in in the last few years is how do we try to help residents deal with the heat from a park perspective and we've, are planning 19 splash pads. We currently have seven of those open right now and 12 more that'll come come about in the next three or four years. We also shade our playgrounds. So we currently have 77 shaded playgrounds and we actually developed a standard because we knew people weren't using the playgrounds until either early in the morning or late at night because they weren't shaded. So we developed a standard. So as we uh, develop future playgrounds, we have a, a mechanism used to bid them out. And my program, Storm to Shade, is based in Tucson Water. Uh, so I just wanted to give a quick intro to Tucson Water to introduce the, the culture there. Um, so we serve about 745,000 customers throughout the Tucson region um, and have a really strong history of conservation and a culture of conservation. Uh, Tucson Water offers rebates for low flow appliances, um, residents who are interested in installing gray water systems, and both active and passive rainwater harvesting systems. So that's either catching water in a, in a big container like a cistern or catching it in your landscape for landscaping use. Uh, we also do a ton of educational programming um, and have for the past three decades to K through 12 students in all school districts throughout the city. 
and we offer free water smart landscaping classes to landscaping contractors. Um, so all of this said, there's a very strong ethic of water conservation in Tucson and out of that has grown a new exciting program that is partnering with Greg and City Parks and Recreation. Oh, and then one other fun thing, we are piloting an ornamental turf ban and turf rebate program. So if any of you are from cities that are interested in that, keep an eye on us. Um, so all of this amazing conservation work over the past several decades has amounted to the crazy fact that we presently serve the same overall quantity of water to our customers today as we did in the 1990s, but with a population of 250,000 more folks living in Tucson. So really amazing uh, results from all that conservation. So kind of looking at what kickstarted this, you know, our mayor and council uh, declared a climate emergency back in 2020. And so that's when we really started delving into, all right, what are we gonna do from a climate action and ad adaptation plan moving forward? And that plan was actually just adopted on March 7th, 2023. The, the focus on that plan was one of the focuses was, you know, electric vehicle road mapping, not just for city vehicles, but for the private sector as well. Uh, we kicked off the urban forestry program. So the mayor actually uh, put out a challenge to plant a million trees in 10 years. And then one of the key ones is the green stormwater in infrastructure program, which Blue's going to talk about. One of the key elements as we look towards heat mitigation is definitely equity. As we heard earlier, it has a tendency to, to impact uh, communities of color, and that's something we will focus on as we implement our policies. Thanks, Greg. So the Storm to Shade program is the city of Tucson's green stormwater infrastructure program, which, as Greg mentioned, is one of the city's um, climate and resiliency initiatives. Um, it was created in 2020 by a vote uh, from mayor and council to approve a new fee that folks started seeing on their water utility bill. This is a fee of 13 cents per CCF of water consumed. A CCF is 100 cubic feet of water or 748 gallons. And that amounts to about a dollar extra on our customers' water bills. So it's a pretty minimal fee. And all of that fund goes into one big pot that I will get into its allocation in coming slides. Uh, this fee is applied to both residential and commercial customers inside the city of Tucson. We don't work outside of the city. And this program is non-regulatory driven. Um, I bring this up because a lot of green stormwater infrastructure programs throughout the country are regulatory driven. Uh, they are in place in order to maintain a certain level of water quality standard. Um, it's generally having to do with the requirements of an MS4 permit. Ours is not, ours is voluntary. We are looking to beneficially reuse stormwater uh, to green up our urban landscapes by capturing that stormwater and putting it into vegetated basins. This is also a part of, the, of Tucson Water's One Water philosophy, which is um, an integrated and holistic approach to all of our water resources and their management. So here's what the Storm to Shade program does. First, we were designed to establish a capital improvement prog program to build new GSI throughout the city of Tucson. We also had a mandate to stand up a maintenance program to maintain everything that we built as well as a lot of a GSI that exists throughout the city already over the past couple decades of various programs building that. Um, and we are to do all of this with a focus on equity. And so really looking to reinvest in communities that are historically disinvested in and looking to those communities that are hottest. Um, and then this graphic kind of shows all of the things that here in, in Tucson, we um, expect GSI to do for us. So everything from uh, mitigating minor flooding to growing shade, um, native vegetation, habitat for our local critters. Uh, Sonoran Desert is one of the most biodiverse deserts in the world, if not the most, in fact, I think it is. And so we have a lot of uh, local flora and fauna that rely on plants. And so we're looking to bring those, those sources of life and vitality back into the city um, using GSI.
So how do we identify projects? Um, our first step is looking to existing City of Tucson improvement projects. So a proposition was passed several years ago called 407 Better Parks and Connections. And this proposition is a sales tax with funding going toward infusing our parks and our connections. So connections being uh, pedestrian ways, greenways, bike paths um, with with improvement. Um, a lot of our infrastructure is um, really outdated and in rough shape. And so these funds are doing things like bringing new lighting to parks, new bathrooms, um, splash pads, water fountains, all of those things that, that we all love to see in our parks. Um, so we look at those projects and say, where can we dovetail and add funding for green stormwater infrastructure in an existing project? We also work really closely with our wards. We have six wards throughout the city of Tucson that are very excellent communicators and liaisons for their communities. And so we work with them to hear their thoughts on where they would like to see investment. And then we use a tool called the Tree Equity Score. This is a tool that was developed by an organization called American Forests, um, which is a mashup of data layers that include everything from socioeconomic indicators demographic indicators, uh, percent of folks living in the home over the age of 50 or below the age of 18, um, as well as indicators of climate vulnerability. So uh, vulnerability to heat and flooding, and then also tree canopy. One other factor that we take into consideration and are kind of still working on teasing out is in terms of where our priorities are is the cost of a project so if we if we define a project simply by the number of trees we can add using gsi projects in streets are much much more expensive significantly more expensive than projects that are either behind the curb of a street or in a park so we really get the most bang for our buck when we're building gsi in parks that being said our streets are a part of the city that everyone has to use. They are hot um, and they also require, they need, they need investment and they need shade for folks that are using them to get where they need to go, particularly if they don't have access to a car. So here is a shot of that tree equity score tool as it applies to Tucson. So what you can see here are the darkest green areas of the city. Uh, indicating the highest levels of wealth and income and tree canopy, so least climate vulnerability. And kind of keep your eye on that big dark green clump in the center. And then you see where Greg is pointing around the Western and Southern parts of the city, that deep dark red, those are where communities are most vulnerable and there is the least amount of green space and tree canopy. So if you keep your eyes kind of focused on that, the next three slides are sort of gonna mirror that. This is a slide of tree canopy. Again, you see that, that deep darkest green area right where it was um, in the previous slide. And then the lighter areas are where there's least tree canopy. And then the next slide will show heat. And you'll see the same thing. Those blue areas are where it's coolest and those red areas are where it's hottest. So we see the same thing over. And then finally, this is a neighborhood vulnerability index. So you see that lightest white area is where folks are least vulnerable. And then the surrounding dark purple lavender colors are where populations are most vulnerable. And so we've got great tools to use to help us determine where to focus investment. And in the next slide, this is a screen grab of where our projects are presently located. So we do have a mandate to spread our funding throughout the six wards of the city. We try to use that tree equity score tool to pinpoint the areas within each ward that have the highest need for investment. Um, and so you'll see a couple of projects in that area that was the wealthiest and the greenest, but not many. And most of them are concentrated in those areas of town that were most in need. Of, of additional green space. Um, and you know, when we talk about green space, we're really talking about uh, urban heat island mitigation. So as Blue started to roll out the Stormy Shade program, it became pretty apparent that 
you know, as we were starting to redesign parks with the uh, Proposition 407 funds, we had to really rethink how our parks were were planned. You know, most of ours were built in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and we would do wall-to-wall -wall turf. We were irrigating everything. So it became apparent that we really need to start thinking about how do we take what Blue's trying to do with the green stormwater infrastructure and incorporate that into our plans and as we redesign parks. Um, because water is so critical and because it's it's you know not a renewable source, we wanted to look at how do we reduce turf that you have to use a lot of water on and then in, in turn increase tree canopy because that's a, that gives you the cooling effect that we're looking to get in these neighborhoods. So we were really looking at a long-term policy of how do we reduce turf? How do we incorporate more of this GSI into our park design? And then in conjunction with the city's mandate to reduce turf, you know, parks are gonna look at functional turf. We wanna balance this because 95% of the properties in Tucson don't have any grass. They just don't have turf in this area. So they do come to the parks for that experience. So we don't wanna eliminate in park, Parks, but we do want to focus on what's functional turf so that we can reduce it but have something that people enjoy. So we'll go through a couple examples real quick here. This is a park that we just reopened about two weeks ago. It started, uh, we started planning for this right before the pandemic and this is actually a school site. You'll see a school in the top left corner here, but this entire area previously would have been in all grass all irrigated turf. So as we'd redesigned this park, um, we started to implement the GSI uh, elements that we'll let Blue talk about, but pretty much all of this yellowish peach area that was previously turf, we are now looking at, you know, decomposed granite and increasing tree canopy. Blue, you wanna talk about the different basins? Yeah, yeah. So, so as Greg said, this park um, was, was in the process of being renovated and reconstructed when the Storm to Shade program came into being in 2020. So this was the very first project that we were able to hop in on. Um, and we absolutely saw an opportunity to add green stormwater infrastructure. So if you look at that schematic, um, there's number one, that is a very long bioswale that is pulling water off of that adjacent avenue that you see, it's, it's called Campbell. So we added sidewalk scuppers to pull water through and under the sidewalk from that very large street into the park. So that will be a very huge volume of water um, adding to support a ton of trees and native vegetation going into that bioswale, which would have, as Greg mentioned, otherwise just been um, Bermuda grass turf that would have been on ir irrigation and, and wasn't looking so hot. Um, and then the second area, that's really cool is the parking lot. So the landscape architect working on this project caught on really quickly to what we were trying to do and added these curb cuts in all of the, the curbs in the parking lot so that water can flow from the parking lot into vegetated basins. And that's wonderful for a Tucson parking lot that's 120 degrees um, many days of the year just to have a little shade added to the perimeter of the parking lot. And then the third is a big kind of, we call it the bonus basin, because um, we didn't even identify this as an opportunity until rather late in the project. And this is another spot where water is being directed from the adjacent street via very long swale and then ending up in this lovely vegetated basin that otherwise would have just been an underutilized, probably dirt area. So as we kind of mentioned, the origin of this project was trying to dovetail efforts with existing city improvement projects. So that 407 bond being the one in this case. Um, this park is also located in a very high priority area for investment, it has very low tree equity score. Um, we also love that the park is, it, it is one in the same property with the, the high school that's located next to it. So it serves a lot of young people and students and families. Um, we added vegetated basins, bioswales, we used sidewalk scuppers to convey water from the street into the park, and we were able to add dozens of native trees and shrubs um, with a total square footage for the GSI component equaling roughly 30,000 square feet. So these three next three slides are a quick run through of how it works. So the, the horizontal lines along the top of the slide 
represent the road. Those blue arrows represent the scuppers that will bring water, stormwater from the road into the park, into that vegetated soil that Greg is hovering over. And that will fill at the starting at the right side of the slide and flowing toward the left, and then ultimately overflow into an adjacent wash in the form of sheet flow. Um, so that's where all that stormwater would have ended up anyway via storm drains. Uh, we just caught it on its way there and put it into the park. Another cool project that we uh, work together on is at Cherry Avenue Park. And you can see we've got a pretty well defined, you know, turf area. And then so all this, you know, non-irrigated space out here is what we call decomposed granite, so rock. And with our with our bonds, we put a dog park in here in the kind of the bottom left hand corner. And as we were getting ready to do that project, our the Pima County Regional Flood Control District approached us and said, hey, can we create a, a stormwater basin in this other corner of the park? And we're like, yeah, we're, we have no plans for it. So you can see a picture there about a year ago after a heavy rain, it did just what we expected to do. It was taking water off the street, going into the basin and filling up there. The benefit we're going to see from this long term, though, as you'll see, we've got trees planted around here, landscaping in the basin. So this is going to make this corner, which right now is just a desert space, it's going to create more of a green infrastructure in that area. It, it was critical from our perspective, the park's perspective, that we need a blues team to really help us understand what type of plant material to put in these basins. This is not an expertise that we had from a staff perspective, but, but blues team was really influential in picking the right type of plant material. And then another project that we, we kicked off uh, about 18 months ago was this is Gene C. Reed Park. It's kind of our Tucson Central Park. And we were looking at how we're going to redo this park over the next 20 to 30 years, thinking about, you know, green storm water infrastructure, trying to reduce heat. And you can see not a huge tree canopy across the park, except for this area, which is the zoo. So what we looked at as we did the master plan was how do we, number one, take this stream that's coming through the park and kind of divert that stream to capture that storm water and, and reuse it in the park to green it up, plant more trees. And this park's got a lot of very old non-native trees. So one of the keys was, as we replant this park and redesign it, how do we plant it, put in uh, native vegetation and what's that do long-term? So we got a cool little illustration of that. This is an Aleppo pine, so a popular tree, but non-native, that uses about 23,000 gallons of water a year. And the goal is, over time, we, we plant two velvet mesquites that use about half that amount of water, but gets us the shade, same shade canopy long term. And then over here is like a typical African sumac tree, uses about 12,500 gallons of water a year, and we'll replace that with three little leaf ash trees long-term to create the same shade canopy. So this was really helpful for the community to understand the importance of how do we revegetate the parks with more native trees that will use less water, but still create the same amount of shade. So lessons learned. We're still a very new program. We only launched in January of 2021, um, but we have, we've learned quite a bit in our short little lives. Um, first of all, Early involvement in project planning is hugely beneficial for saving everyone time and money um, because it prevents change orders. Um, it gets everybody off with a shared vision of where we're going. Super important. Um, we've learned a lot about project costs. I'm sure as everybody here knows, um, things are just drastically more expensive um, today than they were three months ago than they were six months ago. Um, and so we're, we're having to make a lot of decisions about how we're spending our funding and, and if we're willing to, to pay more for what we, what we hadn't budgeted for. Uh, we also know that that varies greatly based on the type of project. So going back to that schema about the cost of a tree, um, projects in the street are extremely expensive as much as they are very beneficial um, projects on parks and on parcels of land uh, are much less expensive. So all just kind of having to, to make decisions about where we're investing and those conversations are ongoing. Um, contractors have been a really interesting piece of this puzzle that uh, we didn't quite anticipate 
up front. Um, first of all, COVID slowed everybody down. We uh, we didn't start Gunny's construction, uh, I think, in, for two or three weeks after the plan and start date because folks just weren't showing up to work. Um, so that's just the reality of the situation. Um, and then expertise and experience working on GSI. Um, Tucson has an amazing grassroots community of water harvesting practitioners um, and a lot of skill, but these are mostly very small sort of um, one person firms and one or a handful of people firms. These are not the large construction contractors that are building our parks and rebuilding our parks. So um, we did a lot of um, very close uh, work with those contractors actually building the GSI so that they would understand what the function of these areas was and how the water was supposed to flow along them and how it all worked. So those photos on the left are um, that was sediment trap uh, attempt number one based on the standard detail that we gave them. And then the photo on the bottom is is the the second attempt after um, I literally got down on my hands and knees and, <laughs> and did a little demonstration. Um, so there's a lot of education and outreach to be done to the contractor community and trying to grow those skills um, uh, in, in a workforce development sort of way. Um, and then stand, standard details and drawings, they're just, um, it's all new. And so we can definitely improve those so that when we hand drawings to a contractor, they are easier to understand. Um, plant palette, as Greg was mentioning, uh, our program only uses native plants. And so that's a, that's a big shift for a lot of folks in the contracting community. It's a shift for the nurseries who don't necessarily grow a lot of full native plants. Um, and so we're, again, a lot of education, a lot of outreach to those contractors and those growers. And then installing irrigation systems versus hand watering is a question that we are wrestling with. Uh, we intend for these projects that we build to be 100% uh, sustained by stormwater alone, but there is an establishment period. And if we are planting dozens and dozens of plants in May or June, and then our summer hits and the monsoon doesn't show up as expected, which is happening more and more these days, uh, those plants are gonna die. Um, and so installing an irrigation system is, is a bit of a necessary evil and a security blanket. I just want to touch quickly on the fact that we have a maintenance program. Um, maintenance is often the, uh, the, the neglected side of green stormwater infrastructure. Everybody loves building shiny new projects, but when it comes to maintaining them, there are not nearly as many conversations or as much excitement often. So, um, a lot of challenges around maintenance, uh, including the fact that GSI is, is owned under various cities' departments. This picture here is a photo of a traffic circle that is GSI um, in a street. So that is technically under the jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation Mobility, whereas what we build in parks is under the jurisdiction of parks, et cetera, et cetera. And all those departments use different asset management systems um, that often don't communicate with one another. Um, so lots of challenges with, with sorting all of that out. Um, then we have a lot of competing interests and protocols. So if we want to build GSI on a well site, we need to talk to Tucson Water to make sure there are not plans uh, for that well site to be um, redrilled or to have a treatment plant added to it. Um, and then there is the issue of homeless and unsheltered folks um, who need shade and a cool respite just as much as the rest of us do, if not more, obviously. Um, but as far as the law enforcement surrounding that, um, adding vegetation and trees also adds a visual barrier for police. And so we're, we're having a lot of conversations about how we can all meet our goals in that respect. Um, and then contractors and uh, staff, um, this, the care of GSI is not your typical Moblo and go, which is what most of the landscaping maintenance contractors are used to practicing. And so we're doing a ton of training to get those folks educated. And the, this slide basically just talks about the fact that we, um, we uh, had the opportunity to partner with U of A on a grant to establish a GSI maintenance protocol, along with a series of trainings and training materials um, 
And that really set us out on the right foot to be able to establish a maintenance program for the city of Tucson that all of the departments have adopted and we can sort of hold up as a model. And finally, we have an enterprise asset management system in the works. Um, so this is the inventory of existing GSI throughout the city of Tucson. The different colors indicate different sorts of projects, whether they be chicanes or curb extensions or basins in the public right of way, traffic circles, rain gardens, et cetera. Um, and so when this program came into being, there was already a ton of infrastructure out there uh, and we are working on rounding all of that up into one big integrated maintenance system. And the photo in the bottom right is one of our contractors out measuring the dimensions of a GSI basin so that we can also use that information to calculate our total capacity in terms of volume of stormwater throughout the city in all of the GSI that we have. I think that's it. And then we'll wrap it up with kind of who our key partners are, Parks and Recreation, working with the Transportation Department, or the County Flood Control District, the Water Department. These are all people that we work with on a regular basis. We definitely need our Planning Development Department to be involved as we develop regulations. Don't don't rule out businesses. We have had private businesses donate money towards the million trees, so that happens pretty regularly. Neighborhood associations are extremely engaged in these projects as well as University of Arizona. So there's a lot of opportunities to partner with other folks. Okay. Y'all set? That's it. Great. Thank you so much, Blue and Greg. Amazing work and a great kind of cross-agency collaboration and kind of bringing your maintenance folks on with you. You know, this is not easy work and not everyone's doing it, but you're doing it and it's really it's really awesome. So we uh, kind of found ourselves a little uh, cut short of time for questions, but let's have at least like three minutes. We'll go the full time. I have a few um, like wrap up comments, but I can do that after the hour. So I just wanted to make sure we got to some of the questions that folks had. Um, so one of the things that came up actually a few times, so hopefully we can kind of combine some of these questions that came in related to community engagement. Um, some, so some folks were kind of wondering, um, how are you handling kind of ongoing community engagement as things evolve, particularly for the Greenwood Park project? And then kind of another related piece is, can you speak, this is for all of you, to how early engagement maybe altered your assumptions or perspectives or outcomes of your project? And kind of like specific community engagement, like if you had one, you know, really impactful community engagement strategy that you used, could you share that? So kind of just a few different questions about community engagement there. So let's start with Anna, since one of those was specifically for Greenwood Park. Um, yeah, so for Greenwood Park, one of the big uh, events that I, I think was super successful is at the end of the master plan, we had a party in the park and we had over a thousand people come. We had um, food provided. We had a bunch of uh, events and activities for kids. We had our master plan printed out at around 20 feet so we could take people on tours of the future master plan. And then we talked about the phasing and the implementation. And so people could see, you know, their input in that master plan and then get excited about that phase one. Um, for the continued engagement, uh, we've We've continued to reach out to the communities. We've had them involved. We've done some fun things for construction. We actually made uh, giant uh, banners that had some uh, hilarious uh, zoo puns. Like it's un we're un we're so excited and it um, it's unbearable how excited we are. And we had a giant bear and people standing in front of it. So we we use that to kind of keep people informed of of what's going on. And so that is um, continued to to move forward. Great. Shelly, anything you want to add about community engagement or yeah, any ongoing community things, engagement? A couple of things I can think of. Um, one is just having the, the meetings all over town and, uh, and not, we started just near the park and then uh, one of our city advisors suggested going to, going, going, taking it on the road. That was really powerful. And then we also added uh, bilingual translation during those meetings. That was also very powerful. The, we also work with our PR firm and with the city folks to make sure that invitations to anything really got distributed broadly. Um, and so in you know non-English speaking uh, publications or social media um, in, um, in, in just so many different places, we were really aggressive about that. And then the third thing was 
unexpected moments. There might be unexpected times where you could have a community celebration. Something that was surprising to me that, that people, someone suggested, and it was wildly popular, is that before we opened the tunnels to traffic, um, a year before the rest of the project for the Land Bridge and Prairie was open, and we had a tunnel party. We allowed Houstonians to walk through. It was going to be a road. And it didn't occur to me that that would be a fun thing. 7,000 people came and they said it was a blast. And they thought that was the project and um, loved it. And people came. I mean, I had people telling me, like, I took off work to come here. I've never been to this park. And so unexpected thing, unexpected, um, use unexpected things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea. And um, Blue and Greg, any any thoughts? You know, your community engagement's a little different. Some of your projects are, you know, kind of city, um, they're kind of through the city and different things, but any anything that you wanted to add about that? Blue, your neighborhood grant program's pretty cool. Right? Yeah, so we, we have a sort of our little sister program, which is community-based, and it is 100 for all the projects that are green stormwater infrastructure projects are driven by communities and so that's really our public <clears throat> engagement mechanism because those projects truly are driven by community whereas as you mentioned diana we're we're a little bit top down because we are the city and we you know we have decided that we will rebuild this park <laughs> um but we do do outreach and some of the things that we find essential are translation services um setting those meetings at times that work with busy people's schedules um often people who have multiple jobs and kids. And so having uh, things for kids to do while they're there um, is huge. Uh, providing food is huge. It's sort of these simple things, but we're just trying to be very conscious of when we're asking something of the community that we're also providing something in return. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, Let's see, um, we, yeah, I work a little bit over time and a lot of the questions actually that were coming in, if folks are still on, th there were some specific questions about like like project pieces for you know either Anna or some of the other folks. So I would uh, recommend that you just reach out to those folks. I don't wanna be uh, too much over time here um, with any questions. So I'm just gonna wrap up a little bit with our uh, just last few things we wanted to, to mention to you all here. So, um, we just wanted to remind you, of course, links to today's recording, presentations, and related resources will be emailed to all registrants within two days. Please also take a minute to fill out the short evaluation that will pop up after you leave the session. Um, someone asked about, um, I think this, the last slide is being shown right now, but if you have questions for any of us, our, um, slide, our emails are on the slides from today, and those will also be shared um, after the webinar. Um, so please visit the events tab at cityparksalliance.org for information about upcoming events. Registrations open for our July 13th member exclusive peer conversation about building community power to advance environmental justice. Um, if you're interested in becoming a City Parks Alliance member to join that event or other events, please visit cityparksalliance.org slash join for information about all of CPA's great member benefits. Um, also wanted to make sure that folks are aware of City Parks Alliance's Greater and Greener 2024 conference, which will take place from June 21st to the 25th in Seattle. Um, we're setting the table for conversations around the complex challenges we all face in using parks to create more equitable, vibrant, resilient, and inclusive communities. Um, we want you to be a part of it. We are currently accepting speaker proposals and encourage you to visit greatergreener.org for more information about session types, conference tracks, and information about submitting a proposal. So we'd like to thank our preventers for jo uh, presenters for joining us today and sharing the amazing work they're doing in partnership with nature and their communities to create a more resilient urban environment for all. So we hope you'll adapt this information in your communities as you explore nature-based solutions to your climate challenges. And last but not least, many thanks to all of you for joining us today and keep up the great work you're doing in our nation's urban parks. So thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good day. <laughs>